All right, welcome everybody to Finding Truth. Tonight we're going to be having a discussion between Dr. Hugh Ross and Dr. Marcus Ross. And we're going to make sure that we say Dr. Ross at least once so both of them can answer. <laughs> that would be really fun. Uh, tonight, um, I was supposed to be hosting this debate, but due to some of the weather around uh, my area, um, I asked Chris if he could do this for me uh, due to the fact that uh, there's a possibility that I may, I may lose power. So with that, I'm just going to go ahead and let Chris take over, and he's going to be the one hosting this conversation between Dr. Marcus and Dr. Hugh Ross. And uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being here tonight. Really appreciate it. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Well, thanks for that introduction, Santi, and I'm very excited to moderate this debate. Uh, before I introduce our debaters and walk through the format, I do just want to say a word or two about why I personally am really excited and honored to be able to play this role in this debate. Um, I have been a young earth creationist for most of my um, uh, most of my faith for 20 years now, um, but I have a lot of friends who are old earth creationists, theistic evolutionists, progressive creationists, intelligent design advocates, everything under the sun. And one of the things that has really saddened me um, is how terribly people on the various sides of this debate often treat each other when discussing this topic or when talking about the topic. So for example, I'm part of a, um, I, I'm, I'm something of a prominent member of an online apologetics and theology community. I have a couple of YouTube streams that have on, admittedly been on break for a while. But, uh, but as part of this community, I've got a lot of friends on the various sides. And what I see is on one hand, my old earth creationist and theistic evolutionist friends posting uh, memes that mock young earth creationists and make fun of them um, seemingly with no they don't seem to care at all how that's going to impact their friends like me that are on the young earth side of the debate so there's there's a lack of compassion and empathy for people coming from many of the people on the old earth creationist and theistic evolution sides but then on the other side of the spectrum i see some young earth creationists treating this as an issue worth dividing over and uh, ostracizing if not outright excommunicating members of churches that don't hold to a young earth creationist uh, position. And so I would really love to see this conversation in the evangelical world start producing more uh, more light rather than and less heat. Um, and I know just from the few minutes I've gotten to hear the Dr. Rosses on the call right now um, as they were speaking with one another before we started this stream, I can tell that they're friendly with one another and that this is going to be the kind of conversation conversation that will produce more light uh, and less heat. So I'm very excited to moderate this and I just hope my appeal to those of you watching wherever you fall on the spectrum, remember that when you're discussing this issue with Christians, you're discussing the issue with brothers and sisters in Christ, um, of course, who also bear the divine image. And as such, please treat them accordingly. Don't let this be an issue worth dividing over and tearing each other apart over. Um, all of that having been said, let me introduce our two debaters today. Astronomer Hugh Ross is the founder of Reasons to Believe, an organization dedicated to integrating scientific fact and biblical faith. His books include Weathering Climate Change, Why the Universe is the Way It Is, and Navigating Genesis. And I remember about 20 years ago, roughly, when I still worked at Microsoft, I remember Dr. Hugh Ross uh, coming and giving a presentation at Microsoft. Um, and so it's interesting how far back that goes. Anyway, Dr. Hugh Ross, thank you so much for participating today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. The other debater is paleontologist Marcus Ross, who is the founder and owner of Cornerstone Educational Supply. He earned his Bachelor's of Science in Earth Science from the Pennsylvania State University. He continued his studies with a Master of Science in Vertebrate Paleontology from the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, and he earned a PhD in Environmental Science, specifically Geoscience, from the University of Rhode Island. He also was, up until fairly recently, the director of the Center for Creation Studies at my alma alma mater, Liberty University, um, which means that I'm going to be rooting for Marcus Ross, not to mention that he holds my side of the debate, but just kidding. Anyway, thank you so much, Dr. Marcus Ross, for participating today. Well, thank you, Chris, and my thanks, too, to Santi, who's uh, who's often, you know, hopefully uh, things will go well for him. Uh, my thanks for Hugh, uh, as well, for joining me. This is the second time that we've had the opportunity to uh, discuss and dialogue and debate on this, and I greatly uh, appreciated and enjoyed the opportunity that we had uh, back in 2016 at Evangel University 
uh, for a debate and discussion. It was very cordial, it was warm, and it was insightful and thoughtful. And I, I really appreciated uh, Dr. Hugh Ross's uh, approach uh, to that issue and uh, the gentlemanly spirit that he brought to it. So that's one of the reasons why I was very uh, grateful to say, yes, I, I'd, love, I'd love to uh, have another discussion with you tonight. And what I remember about that, uh, Mark, is, was we talked for about three hours after the uh, presentation <laughs> yeah. was over. And I got to know you in a way that often doesn't happen when you're in a public. Yeah, conference. it was very nice to, to spend a couple of days at that conference and, and uh, you know, sit around and chat for a little bit. Right, right. See, viewers, this is exactly why I'm excited to participate in this, because this is the kind of friendly, brotherly conversation I think we need to have. Um, as a word of, uh, or as sort of a disclaimer, um, in order to avoid the inevitable confusion of referring to Dr. Ross and having both Dr. Rosses respond at, at the same time, I'm going to bypass the sort of academic um, etiquette and refer to Dr. Hugh Ross as Hugh and Dr. Marcus Ross as Marcus, and I'll ask for their forgiveness later. But in the meantime, let me walk through our our format for today's debate really briefly. Um, this is at least the format I was given by Santi, so if I'm wrong about this, Santi's, it's Santi's fault, not mine. But what I have in front of me is that Dr. Ross, Hugh Ross, <laughs> see, I already did it. Hugh <laughs> will begin with a 12-minute opening statement, and then Marcus will, will have his 12-minute opening statement. And then there will be 40 minutes of open discussion comprised of four 10-minute conversational periods. The first 10 minutes, um, Hugh will be leading the discussion with Marcus following along and participating. The next 10 minutes, those roles will swap. Those roles will swap again for the third set of 10 minutes, and then they'll return to uh, Marcus for the fourth and final of those 10-minute conversational periods. And then there'll be eight minutes of closing thoughts from each participant. And then in whatever time we have remaining before both debaters have to leave, uh, we'll try to field a question or two or three from the audience as time permits. So with that all out of the way, um, if you are ready, Hugh, Dr. Hugh Ross, um, I'd welcome you to begin your 12 minute opening statement. Yeah, and please call me Hugh. I mean, nobody calls me Dr. Ross except my mother. So uh, thank you. So, well, there's a lot that Marcus and I agree on, and I, I'd like to start with that. I mean, I think we both agree this is not a salvation issue. So it's not an issue over which we should uh, part company. And uh, it's not a creedal issue either. I mean, the age of the earth doesn't show up in any of the creeds of the church. And I think Marcus would agree with me. We shouldn't divide over things that are not in the uh, Christian creeds. Um, but I'd also like to add that it's not a scientific debate. I mean, uh, when you look in the scientific literature, you will not find uh, research papers uh, written making the claim, hey, this is uh, scientific evidence uh, for a young earth. And uh, where I've seen that publicly demonstrated, I did radio debates with uh, Dwayne Gish and John Morris of the Institute for Creation Research. And the moderator asked both Dwayne and John this question. Do you know of any scientists who, independent of a particular Bible interpretation, ever concluded that there was scientific evidence uh, for a young earth? And both of them are honest and say, no, we don't know anyone. And so, uh, you know, when you go to scientific meetings, uh, this is not an issue for debate, but it's definitely a biblical debate. I'd also like to add it's a relatively recent biblical day, debate. I appreciate uh, what you said in the introduction about how acrimonious this debate can be. And uh, you know, if you look in the days before uh, Darwinian evolution, Christians did discuss this, but there wasn't any of the acrimony and there was a lot of hesitancy on it. You know, the first Christian scholar I know of that took a definitive stand on the age of the earth uh, based on the Bible was Isaac Newton. Uh, so it's, it's uh, again, only in the early part of the 20th century do you actually see people uh, saying, hey, you know, this is an issue we need to debate. And interestingly, uh, the young earth uh, position actually comes out of the global flood model. So the global flood model came first, and then the young earth model came next. This is well documented by the historian Ronald Numbers uh, in his book on uh, uh, creationism. Uh, now, in terms of the biblical debate, again, there's a lot of agreement. Uh, I would suspect that Marcus, like I would, would endorse sola scriptura. 
uh, that you know, God has given us two reliable books of revelation, the book of nature and the book of scripture. Both are utterly trustworthy and reliable. Both come from the same God from whom it's impossible to lie or deceive. But the Bible is the only authoritative revelation in the sense that the reformers recognize authority can only rest in a person. And so because the Bible is authored uh, by uh, real persons, uh, it has authority that we don't see in the book of nature. Uh, but in my perspective, that does not in any way demean the reliability uh, of the uh, book of nature. Now, there is a big debate between theology and science, but theology is our interpretation of the book of scripture and science is our interpretation of the book of nature. So I would hold the position that both the book of nature and the book of scripture are inerrant. Both are meant to be read literally and consistently. Uh, and I would also think that we both agree uh, that Adam and Eve were the first humans, that, that God created, specially created, not evolved, not common descent, but specially created, and that all human beings are descended from that one man and one woman. Uh, I'd also agree with Marcus that the creation of Adam and Eve is a relatively recent event. Uh, we're looking at tens of thousands of years, not millions of years. And you know, as I've engaged young earth creationist theologians, I also find that there's agreement that the Hebrew word yom that's translated as day has four distinct literal definitions. It can mean part of the daylight hours, all the daylight hours, a 24 hour period, or a long but finite period of time. It cannot be used for indefinite time. It can only be used uh, for a finite uh, time period. But the reason why I take an old earth perspective on scripture is that when I first picked up the Bible at age 17, I noticed that this word day uh, has three distinct definitions, even from the English translation that's clear as you go through it. Because in creation day one, it uses the word day for the daylight hours. Creation day four, it uses the word day uh, for a 24 hour period. But Genesis 2, 4 uses that same word day to refer to the entirety of creation history. So those are the three of the four definitions used on the first page of the Bible. Uh, but the reason why I believe that these creation days are six consecutive long periods of time is because the first six days are bracketed by an evening and a morning. They each end with a phrase, evening was, morning was, day two, day three, day five, uh, whatever. Uh, but, and I didn't know as a young man what the words evening and morning meant. Hebrew lexicons uh, give several definitions for each word, but at a minimum, they mean that each day has a definite start time and a definite end time. But when you get to creation day seven, there's no evening morning phrase. It's not there. And uh, you also see two passages, Psalm 95 and Hebrews 4, that tell us we're still in God's seventh day. Uh, so that's a biblical indication uh, that the uh, seventh day of God's uh, creation continues on into the present. And when I saw that as a 17-year-old, it answered for me a fossil record enigma. And Marcus, I know you're a paleontologist. And so what got me growing up is my parents thought I was being obsessive about physics and astronomy because I was reading four or five books on physics and astronomy a week. And they wanted me to have a broader perspective. So at age 11, they bought our family this big, thick book on evolutionary biology. I was the only one that read it. I remember telling my parents, the numbers don't add up. We see all these new uh, classes and uh, families and uh, orders and phyla before humanity, and we see none of that after humanity. They told me to talk to my science teachers. My science teachers told me to talk to the science professors I knew. But when I picked up the Bible, it answered the fossil record enigma. For six days, God creates. That explains all the new phyla, orders, and classes we see before humanity. But on the seventh day, God stops creating. So it explains why we're not seeing any of that in the human era. It also answered for me 
why so many astronomers believe in God and why so few biologists believe in God. In astronomy, our data comes from the past because of the velocity of light. Almost everything we observe is in the six days of creation. Whereas with biologists, the vast majority of them do their research in the human era. And therefore you'll see biologists saying, we see no scientific evidence uh, for the supernatural handiwork of God. My response is, well, of course, they're looking on the wrong day. They're looking on the seventh day and explains why so many astronomers are followers of Jesus Christ because their data is coming uh, from the six uh, days of creation. The other thing I would add is that the Bible repeatedly says that the laws of physics do not change. I mean, Jeremiah 33 is one example where God complains to the Jews and say, you change your mind all the time, but I'm a God that doesn't change. I'm immutable. As proof, look at the laws that govern the heavens and the earth. As they don't change, I don't change. And because the laws of physics don't change, we can do science. I mean, it's no accident that the scientific revolution exploded out of Reformation Europe. The biblical principle of unchanging uh, physics meant that we could trust what we were seeing uh, in the world of nature. But here's the problem I find for young earth creationists. Every young earth creationist model I looked at critically depends on radically altered laws of physics at the fall of Adam and at the flood of Noah. And the Bible explicitly rules that out in multiple places. Moreover, astronomical observations rule it out. Because when we look at a distant star or a distant galaxy, we're seeing the light of that galaxy or star as it was in the past, because it takes time for light to reach our telescope. As we measure that light, uh, we can determine the laws of physics when the light left that star or galaxy. And it basically affirms that there's been no change in any of the laws of physics or the radiometric decay rates uh, over the past uh, 12 and a half uh, billion years. And we can do it to 18 places of the decimal now. Uh, so we have high precision measurements that affirm what the Bible wrote thousands of years ago indeed is true. In fact, I cite that as evidence that the Bible is scientific predictive power, the power to predict uh, future uh, scientific uh, discoveries. So uh, I think I've gone through about eight or nine minutes. I don't know. I haven't been watching a clock, uh, but I'm prepared to give the rest of the time uh, over uh, to Marcus. All right. Well, thank you for that. Uh, slightly over 10 minute opening statement, uh, Dr. Hugh Ross. Uh, Marcus, I'll now turn things over to you for your 12 minute opening. Well, thank you. And thank you, Hugh, for uh, that beginning uh, to our discussion. So uh, for myself, uh, what I would uh, like to present a little bit here in terms of my overall perspective, several things that I do agree uh, with Dr. Hugh Ross on concerning sola scriptura and the primacy of the Bible in order to uh, direct and guide things. Uh, when we take a look at our approach to scripture and science, uh, what we as Christians certainly hope is that we find some way of concert between the two. We recognize that there is a biblical domain that involves our understanding of the text, uh, that under, uh, involves our interpretation of the text, that is grounded in concepts like inerrancy and has its own means of testing and applying what we learn from the scripture so that we know that we are uh, interpreting things well, that we are applying the word of God rightly to circumstances both in our lives and hopefully towards the help of others uh, as we spread both the gospel and the light of that gospel uh, around. So in one sense, there is a biblical domain where we operate. For myself as a scientist, there is also a scientific domain in which I operate, which is grounded by certain philosophical uh, commitments. For example, that the universe is in fact knowable, right? Uh, that human uh, cognition is capable of discerning certain things from the universe itself, that we can uh, interpret nature's clues in certain ways that are accurate, uh, at least to the best of our ability and that we can construct hypotheses and test and apply them. So uh, like the biblical domain, there are uh, overriding approaches, uh, philosophical guiding posts. There are 
textual versus natural clues. There are interpretations and hypotheses, and there are testing and application for both. And for many, um, for example, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, the late uh, paleontologist and the lion of evolution in the United States for the second half of the 20th century, he said that there was a firm line of division between the biblical and the scientific domains, uh, that there was no overlap between the two. And in much of our culture, that is kind of the way that uh, we are told is that you've got your faith and your spiritual approach, and then you've got your scientific approach, and never the twain shall meet. But as a young earth creationist, I reject that because we know that all of what God has made and all of what God has said comes from him. Now, it's interpreted through fallen man, and the world itself is fallen, and so there can be difficulties there, and yet there should be a way in which the biblical and the scientific domains reach an interface, a, a place where there's a table and chairs so that we may talk across these different disciplines to learn from each and hopefully gain a better understanding of the world as a whole. Now, as a young earth creationist, I'm going to affirm a certain historical series of events uh, that are grounded, I think, in the text of scripture and have been affirmed since the earliest days of the church and before that, all the way through to the present. Uh, later on, perhaps I'll take issue with a few things that uh, Dr. Hugh Ross had mentioned about our history uh, and where we see things in the church believed, such as young earth, which goes all the way back to the first century. But looking at Genesis 1 as a chapter and Genesis 2, we find, uh, at least I do, that there is concert between those two chapters. This is a place where Dr. Hugh and I agree that uh, Genesis chapter 2 gives us extra and added details about the events that are happening on the sixth day of creation. Unlike uh, Dr. Ro uh, Hugh Ross, I believe that the days of Genesis are laid out as a sequential period of six actual days like days that you and I experience them. That the Hebrew word yom is intended for us to be understood as a 24-hour period of time, a rotational day. The days that are described in Genesis 1 are days with respect to the earth and uh, its experience. They are not God's days or some other sort of analogy. They are a day as we would experience it if we were yet there. And over the course of those six days, the world is prepared and created. Various different components are uh, placed in a logical and meaningful order to the point where we reach the sixth day, the crowning achievement of God is the creation of man. And in Genesis chapter two, again, there's additional details and more uh, information that is given about specifically how God creates Adam and Eve. Again, Dr. Hugh Ross and I will agree that Adam and Eve are the first uh, human beings. However, we will have some disagreements there because he also believes that there are other human-like creatures uh, that God created prior to Adam and Eve. And, as a young earth creationist, I will place those fossils in a different setting. Once Adam and Eve are uh, created in the garden, they shortly thereafter, at some point, sin and fall, bringing death, both spiritual and physical, to themselves. And the consequences of their sin has reverberations throughout the rest of the created economy. The fall of man does not merely affect humans in the spiritual sense. It affects the entire world because humans are placed in dominion over it. And the curses that we see on both the ground and the serpent actually reflect the areas of dominion over the land uh, and dominion over uh, the creatures as a way of showing that the curses effects are extending out into every area over which we have responsibility. Now, some thousands of years, 1500 years later, or maybe more, uh, there is a global flood at the time of Noah. The text is quite clear. That the flood is both universal for humanity and global in its extent. I use the term global here uh, somewhat colloquially. You could use the term worldwide since the ancient Israelites weren't thinking in terms of a globe. But what we find with the ancient Israelites and with later New Testament writers is that the uh, flood at the time of Noah is as big as the world that they know it happens to be. That is that the, even if you argue, for example, that the Israelites' conception of the world was smaller than what we have today, certainly likely, the perspective of the world of Peter and Jesus was even larger than the ancient Israelites, and yet the flood was entirely worldwide for them as well. The Bible is quite consistent on this fact that the waters of the world, of the flood, I'm sorry, uh, covered the entire world, and we will find that the flood is a complete reshaping of the world 
and it is intended to convey that the world has been completely undone and must be created in its entirety again, in a sense. If you read Genesis chapter 8, shortly after reading Genesis chapter 1, you'll find something fascinating, and that is that the events of the reduction of the waters following the peak of the flood mirror the events of Genesis 1. The world is being created anew. It has been destroyed and restarted. And that's not just for humans, that's for the entirety of the world. Hence the need for a gigantic barge of an ark. It includes animals such as birds, who otherwise would be able to ride out and fly away from any sort of localized catastrophe. Following the flood, there is a period of recolonization of both man and animals. And it's in this place that young earth creationists will put, say, uh, Neanderthals, Homo erectus, and a variety of other um, now extinct members of the genus Homo and uh, other non-Homo uh, non individuals. But something like Neanderthals, uh, and uh, I think have uh, imminent evidence of having been human, as human as you and I are. They're uh, descendants of Noah and his family. Uh, they display levels of cognition, levels of technology, levels of communicative ability, levels of uh, travel, that are every bit as sophisticated as you and I would be able to muster under the same sorts of chaotic conditions after the flood. And after that, we finally get to a point of Abraham. And from that point in history onward, Dr. Hugh Ross and I are in great agreement about what happens in the Bible. So our argument is primarily about what's happening in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And after that, he and I would probably be very, very uh, you know, chummy over almost uh, all the other aspects of things. Now, a couple of uh, particulars uh, that I hope that we'll be able to get to in our uh, dialogue session coming up. And that is uh, some of the evidences that I think that point to the earth being young, both scriptural and scientific. Uh, the structure and terminology of the words in Genesis chapter one. Uh, for example, Dr. Ross brought up Yom, we can talk more about that, but the word there in Genesis chapter one is intended to help us understand that God created the world in a series of six actual days. But this is uh, backed up by other passages in the scriptures, such as Exodus 20, Exodus 31. Then we see the genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11 give us an understanding that the world's history is both finite, recent, and connected to humanity itself. Uh, there can be gaps in those genealogies, but those gaps cannot be altogether too large without bending the genealogies into something that is unrecognizable. We see affirmations of the global flood, not only in Genesis, but also in uh, the New Testament. For example, um, Second Peter, uh, well, First Peter, in uh, Second Peter in two different occasions, Second Peter three especially, statements of Jesus. Uh, we see that, for example, Romans chapter eight talks about the groaning of creation as something that has happened, and using language that is all reflective of the fall. So there are a number of reasons why we should think that the Earth is young from a scriptural standpoint. From a scientific standpoint, there are good arguments for a young Earth. It is not entirely easy. There are plenty of good arguments for an ancient Earth or ancient universe. But nonetheless, there are good evidences that there was a recent and global flood uh, and a recent Earth that comes from carbon-14 in ancient fossils. It comes from uh, radio halos that we see in granites from uh, small atoms you know, or large atoms called polonium. The uh, preservation of ancient soft tissues from uh, dinosaur fossils and a number of others show evidence of a recent uh, creation. We also see things like what's called biotribation. This is when organisms stir up the, so uh, the sediment and the levels of biotribation that we see in the fossil record don't look anything like what would be expected if the Earth was extremely ancient. In fact, it's quite different. Uh, also, like I said, the humanity of things like Neanderthals and other hominids, along with uh, wide-scale evidence of hybridization, gives us an indication that the species of organisms that we see alive on the Earth today or recently dead, um, in the case of Neanderthals, for example, are actually uh, quite compatible with a young Earth perspective of a post-flood diversification of life rather than a long protracted period of either separate creation or a long protracted period of evolution over time. So there are scores of different types of evidences that one could point to. And I would say uh, as, as a last point on this, that this is both a scientific and a, um, and a biblical issue. 
It's also a historical issue. Uh, it's also uh, an issue of uh, philosophy and others. But to say that uh, this is not a scientific issue is quite misleading. To give you an idea of how difficult it can be for young Earth creationists to say, get uh, a paper published in a journal. I've had several papers rejected from journals precisely because I was a young Earth creationist, even while the papers that I submitted had nothing to do with young Earth creationism. In fact, actually approached the age uh, of Earth issue or biological evolution issues from a completely conventional approach. Simply being known as a young Earth creationist was enough for an uh, editor at a major paleontology journal. Uh-oh. He dropped out of the call, it looks like. That's no good. I hope he calls back. Well, he was about 30 seconds over his time anyway. I was letting him finish his thought. Santi and Dr. Ross, are you guys both able to hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Well, let's um, wait for a minute and see if Marcus is able to connect again. Okay. Um, Santi, do you want to... Um, come on the call or, or or reach out to marcus somehow or anything like that or yeah i can try to reach out to him really quick um well gosh that's that's a bit of a bummer well he that's might have had a power outage i mean it happens all over the country now and if that's the case he should be able to pop in within less than a minute right well i guess we will find out um in order to uh prevent dead air Maybe I will ask you a question or two, Hugh. Sure. Um, you mentioned in your opening statement that you uh, came to the realization that the phrase evening and morning in Genesis 1 was a way of saying that these periods of time had a definitive start and a definitive, definitive end. Whereas I think for young earth creationists like me, it seems as though evening and morning is a way of emphasizing that this is indeed a 24 hour day. So the question I have for you while we wait to try to get Marcus back on the call um, is, can you give me any examples of elsewhere in scripture where the phrase evening and morning uh, gives a longer period of time than 24 hours, a start and an end? Or is, or is that phrase only used of 24 hour days? Well, young earth creationists will make the comment that there's about 37 places in the Bible where evening and morning are used outside of Genesis 1 and how it consistently refers to a 24 hour period. If you actually look up all those passages, you'll see that in only one case does the word evening and morning even appear in the same sentence. And the word day doesn't show up there. I mean, the one example is Psalm uh, you know, uh, 51, 17, where King David says, I'll pray unto the Lord in the evening and morning and noontime. In other words, Genesis 1 is unique and it is using evening and morning for natural history. You don't see that anywhere else in the Bible. And the phrase you see in Genesis 1, evening was, morning was, day X. That again is unique uh, to Genesis chapter 1. You don't see it anywhere else. So again, when people make these statistical claims, you need to actually look up all the passages and just see what the context is in each case. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for that answer. Uh, Marcus, welcome back. Uh, sorry, I tried, I wanted to uh, avoid dead air. Um, and just so you know, I let you go about 30 seconds over your time limit anyway. Um, so okay. if it's, if it's okay with you to let that final point you were making about this being a scientific issue, uh, let it stand with what you were able to get out before power ended, then I'd love to move us on to the discussion period, if that's okay with you both. Sure. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't realize exactly when the uh, the power cut on me. I apologize for that. So. No, nothing to apologize for at all. Um, how dare you not be able to control the weather and, and and prevent power outages from happening? All right. Well, I'm excited for this next portion. Um, as somebody that is somewhat known for debating, um, I, I think the most important part of a debate is the question and answer portion. Um, in other kinds of formal debates, it's called cross uh, cross examination. We're more doing it conversational style here, sort of an open discussion. But each 10 minute period will be sort of controlled or led by one of the two debaters. And the first segment of 10 minutes will begin with Hugh Rob. 
Chaos leading. So, Hugh, uh, feel free to take the reins for 10 minutes, and um, I might chime in here and there if, uh, if needed to keep the discussion going. Yeah, please interrupt because, I mean, it's your show, and so take it the direction you want it to go. Uh, but I think one thing that came out of Marcus's discussion is one clear area where we disagree is over uh, Homo erectus, the Neanderthals, the Denisovans, the Australopithecines. We had reasons to believe would put them in the same category as the orangutans and the chimpanzees. And as we cite the scientific literature, one, we're unable to find any undisputed evidence that they showed a level of technology or behavior that's superior to what we see in the chimpanzees. Uh, there's no evidence that Neanderthals had control over fire. The tools that they used consisted of a single piece of wood or a single rock. And over the course of a quarter of a million years, we see no advance in their technology. Where as soon as humans come upon the scene, we see rapid technological development. Uh, you know, we see symbolism. Symbolism seems to be unique to humans. So we take the position that we human beings are exceptional. We're exceptional compared to all other species of life on the planet Earth. Uh, we don't classify these bipedal primates that preceded Adam and Eve as humans at all. We put them in the same category as the great apes. And also there's recent scientific literature making the point that these Neanderthals, Denisovans, uh, Homo erectus, they never had a large population. Recent papers are now stating at most the Neanderthals may have hit a peak population of 15,000 individuals, but more likely less than 8,000. And when you look at their geographical range, that means they're looking at about 0 0.001 Neanderthal per square mile. And that explains why when you look at their DNA, we see that they're highly inbred. You'd expect that given the very low population level and very low population density. But with population levels that low, and with the degree of inbred genetics that we see, there's no possibility that they're going to evolve. But that's probably one point where Marcus and I agree, uh, is that, uh, you know, we're both uh, anti-naturalists. I mean, I appreciate what you've written, Marcus, about the Cambrian explosion, how this can't possibly be a naturalistic event. I totally back you up on that. Matter of fact, as an astrophysicist, I'd say, I think we can make an even stronger case because what we see in the Avalon explosion is the moment oxygen jumps from less than 1% in the atmosphere to 8%, that's a very sudden event in the geological record. The moment that happens, you immediately see the Avalon animals as big as two meters across. We go from nothing but microbes to these animals without any time delay. And likewise with the Cameron explosion, the moment the oxygen hits 10% and allows animals to have internal organs, digestive tracts and circulatory systems, we immediately see uh, these new phyla of Cambrian life. And uh, you know, I've been citing authors like James Valentine who makes the point that, hey, if this is naturalistic evolution. It's gonna be driven uh, by natural selection, mutations, gene exchange and epigenetics. And there's been some speculation that maybe there's a fifth mechanism that's been overlooked, but at least the scientific papers I've read said, if there is a fifth mechanism, it accounts for way less than 1% of all the change that we see. And we understand those four mechanisms well. And James Valentine has made the point, these are gonna generate small changes within a species. And therefore, if it's naturalism, we're gonna get the proliferation of a species and if you wait long enough, you get the proliferation of genera. If you wait even more time, the proliferation of genera will produce new families and then new orders and new classes and last of all, new phyla. But his comment, and he's not alone, I can cite eight different paleontologists that say, when we look at the Avalon and Cameron explosions, we see the precise opposite. The phyla show up first. We get a diversification of phyla they all show up immediately, simultaneously, at the moment the oxygen permits their existence. And then later we get the proliferation of classes and then orders and families. And uh, last of all, we get the species. 
It's the exact opposite of what you'd expect from a nationalistic perspective. And I bring this up, Marcus, because I think this is a fertile area where both young Earth creationists and old Earth creationists can agree. And I think having met you before, I think you see this as a far more significant issue to engage non-Christians with than the age of the earth. I mean, if we're concerned about people coming to faith in Christ, let's lead with that. Um, and you also brought up uh, biblical inerrancy. What I find really fascinating. Really, before you before you go yeah. on, Hugh, uh, yeah. I just wanted to point out that we're a little past five minutes into the ten minute first um, discussion period. Um, so maybe before you mention inerrancy, maybe we could give Marcus a chance to chime in with any thoughts on the first thing that you were d d discussing. If that's okay. Yeah, and you too, for that matter. Oh, I'm not smarter and formed enough to <laughs> to participate in that, but maybe I'll chime in if, if I feel the need. But Marcus, any thoughts on what Hugh was talking about, about the importance of fighting naturalism, um, sort of united arm in arm as young earth and old earth creationists? Well, uh, thank you. And, and Hugh, I appreciate uh, your kind words about some of the work that I did early on in my career with the Discovery Institute folks uh, in, in working on that style. Uh, what I kind of came to approach though later on after I finished my doctorate degree was something that my PhD advisor had said. Um, and that was, Marcus, if you're gonna be a creationist, just be a creationist. He was not terribly impressed actually by intelligent design stuff. Now he thought it was a little conspiratorial and I, I wasn't so inclined. Um, but at the same time, one of the things that I understood as I worked with the intelligent design community as a grad student, was that if I wanted to operate as a paleontologist, I had to operate as if I was an old earth creationist within the ID community. And to be honest, I don't think old earth creationism is correct. And so I think that it has a very limited capabilities of opening up the point of discussion of naturalism. I thought early on in my career that it had much greater potential, which is why I was willing to work with the ID community uh, and work on projects like the Cambrian Explosion. Uh, but as it comes out, I look at the Cambrian explosion in a very different sort of way than some sort of design event that happened 540 million years ago. Uh, I think that uh, the Ediacaran animals that you're referring to with regards to the Avalon uh, and the Cambrian organisms represent some of the first ecosystems that are destroyed during Noah's flood. And the reason why we see um, the first phyla and the first classes, these first major uh, organizational groups, these higher order uh, biological categories is simply because we're seeing the first representatives of those not in time but in sequence of destruction that is we find that the avalon communities the cambrian communities are just that they are entire communities of organisms that are operating as a functional ecosystem and uh, they are uh, not certainly an evolutionary situation you and i both agree on that but we're going to disagree about what those communities are. You think that they're an early set of created works of God, uh, and I think that they represent an initial uh, group of organisms destroyed during the flood. Now, if I can back up to another uh, topic that you had brought up with regard to Neanderthals, Denisovans, and other hominins, um, most of the organisms that are assigned to the genus Homo, I am going to affirm as members of humans. Uh, and the idea that we could equate them to chimpanzees or say that they are equivalent in their mental or uh, tool making capability with chimpanzees really misstates the evidence that we have from the fossil record. Uh, just thinking about Neanderthals themselves, we know that they did in fact uh, utilize fire and in fact made spaces within caves, deep enough in caves that fire was going to be necessary in order for the construction of them. We know that they cooked plants and animals based on material from the dental calculus, the plaque on their teeth. We know that they also constructed uh, elaborate stone structures within caves. They used sophisticated stone tools, not single uh, sticks. They made, for example, the very likely were the uh, producers of the Shonigan spears, which were made from a particular part of a particular type of tree not near the edge of the bark and not at the core, but right in the middle where you had strong yet still flexible spears that were seven feet long and tapered towards the back. So they were front heavy. These were throwing spears that could be launched. And these were discovered in a uh, preserved in a, a coal like bog along with the butchery sites uh, of a whole bunch of horses. So they were hunting horses 
uh, by probably driving them up against the lake shore and hitting them with very sophisticated spears that are about as equivalent in their capabilities as a modern javelin for the Olympics. Uh, these uh, individuals had language and speech, and we know that because we know that they must have boated their way towards several islands uh, that have the tools and remains of themselves. That boating over something like the Mediterranean, there's a number of sites in which Neanderthals are found on Mediterranean islands, would have required language in order to communicate with one another. You can't just get into a boat and start grunting. You've got to be able to tell people where to go. We also know that they made leather and jewelry and, importantly, things like twine. They actually made string, not just by a little strand of something they happened to find, but by peeling apart wood material, twisting it together, uh, three strands in order to make a cord, and then taking those cords and twisting them in the opposite direction in order to make rope. These individuals were making tools and engaged in probably long-term, uh, long-distance trade based on what we can see from some shells that were found alongside Neanderthals that came from hundreds of miles away. And to, uh, to relegate them to something like chimpanzees, I think denigrates their humanity in a substantial way. We also um, know that they interbred with us, um, as well as the Denisovans. And so there's, I think, a wide variety of evidences that uh, these individuals are, in fact, human and should be considered part and parcel of the human uh, community. So I'd like to um, interject for a moment and say we're a little bit over a minute into the second 10 minute period of discussion time. And I'm wondering if maybe since this is now Marcus's turn to lead, maybe it would be an opportunity, if this is okay with you, Marcus, for Ross, to, uh, sorry, um, Hugh, to address your, um, sta your, your, your claims about the Neanderthals being much more like humans than perhaps uh, reasons to believe is, is willing to concede. Is that okay? Oh, yeah, I'd be happy to continue on with this discussion and let this flow. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. That sounds good. And we've written extensively about this. We have a book on uh, Who is Adam. You'll also mm -hmm. see a lot of web articles. I mean, we deal with the Twine article, for example. If you actually read the paper, we're talking just one millimeter length. And uh, that one millimeter length is something that can easily be produced without any intelligent input whatsoever. And a number of scientists have written papers saying, there's no basis for claiming that the Neanderthals uh, had the capacity uh, to fabricate ropes and twine uh, based on that one paper. Likewise, when you look at their fire control, that's the same as what we see for chimpanzees. They opportunistically took advantage of wildfires. We see no evidence that they had control of fire. I mean, for example, if you look at the Neanderthal remains, we see that all the evidence for their association with fire is in the summertime, not the wintertime. If they actually had control over fire, you'd expect to find far more evidence for winter use than summer use. We see the exact opposite. And it's a classic example, if you're gonna dive into this issue, you want to read all the scientific literature. You can't just cite one paper. You wanna see how the rest of the scientists respond to that paper. And all these claims for Neanderthal sophistication, every one of them has been disputed. Uh, by anthropologists who are not theists, saying, hey, we can't put them in the category. There's no evidence that they had symbolic capability or language capability. You do see papers making these claims. But what's interesting is that people making those claims do so from a worldview perspective of trying to diminish the exceptionalism of we human beings. And I personally see this as a fundamental biblical doctrine, that we humans are different from the rest of life on planet Earth. We alone are created in the image of God. We alone have a spirit. And we don't see any evidence of that uh, in the Neanderthals or Homo erectus. And again, with their very small populations, uh, we wouldn't expect to see that. And again, we've been searching the scientific literature saying, show us something undisputed that puts these creatures in a different category than the chimpanzees. And we've been unable to find any. Well, if, if I might uh, bring to this, Hugh, I think that's part of your worldview, though. Uh, you're committed to Homo sapiens sapiens as the only possibility of humans made in the image of God. That's been a longstanding position that you've taken. And so the fact that you can find a paper or two that disputes whether or not the twine uh, is... It's can be not just a paper, Hugh, Marcus. Not, not, hold, on, hold on, Hugh. You had, you had yeah. your chance there. 
uh, I'm looking to dialogue here. The fact that you can find uh, individuals within the anthropological community who dispute this or that other finding, the anthropological community is enormous. I've read the books that you have produced along with Fuzz on, on this, and I've read many of your uh, responses to some of these things. But uh, to say, for example, that Neanderthals only made fire in the summertime doesn't make any sense of things like what we see in Brunicale Cave, where they had to go deep into the darkest recesses of the cave where there is no sunlight whatsoever. This is pitch black, can't see your face, hand in front of your face back. They broke stalactites and stalagmites, arranged them in circles, and there were fires on top of the sheared tops. So yes, we do read the papers, Hugh, and we do take a look at these and we adjudicate them. This is what we have to do as scholars. But what we find is that the Neanderthals that were living in Brunichel Cave had actually set up some type of sacred space or something similar to that. This is the best explanation that we have. Uh, William Lane Craig certainly uh, thought that was the case in his recent book. He laid out a lot of very positive evidence for the humanity of the Neanderthals. I think he makes a very powerful case. Uh, I'm in agreement with him that the Neanderthals were in fact human beings. And uh, he mentions the Shodian spheres, he now mentions uh, quite a few other sorts of things. This argument that Neanderthals were no better than chimpanzees simply doesn't reflect anthropology in the 21st century. It, it's, it, it really is a denigration to them in an attempt to try and cleave some sort of um, radical separation between them and us when we know that we bred with them for example, that, that you and I, Hugh, both carry Neanderthal genes with us. And that means that we've interbred and it means that we were compatible in that sort of way, along with the Denisovans. And we know that some people on earth have over 5% of their DNA coming from the Denisovans. We don't even know exactly what they looked like, but they were closer to the Neanderthals genetically than they are to us. This indicates to me that we are looking at a post-flood you know, melee or melee melange of, uh, of humanity and we have different people groups living in different areas. The population sizes all agree with you, were fairly low. Uh, and inbreeding was a, a difficulty certainly for the Neanderthals, but they show technological capabilities every bit as robust as you and I do. Yeah, again, I'm disputing that claim. I mean, uh, when you read the scientific literature, these claims that these Neanderthals were technologically sophisticated, every claim is highly disputed. Uh, by not disputed Hugh. I mean, talk to I, even I, Tattersall. I mean, we've talked to him personally, and he says, "Look, uh, we humans are not like the Neanderthals. We stand totally apart from them." And you know, again, read the scientific literature. And you know, believe me, Hugh, we cite that, all the last year. I've been deep in the weeds on this stuff. So yeah, can I? I want to ask a question for both of you that might um, be the answers to which might be beneficial to our viewers because I know it would be beneficial to me. And that is, uh, when it comes to specifically the debate between young Earth and old Earth creationism, um, what is the import of the uh, of the question we're discussing here? Whether or not Neanderthals are humans, uh, or is this just an interesting side discussion that is only tangentially relevant to the debate. Well, there's also the issue of, you know, where do you place these uh, creatures? Again, if you read the scientific literature, they significantly predate we human beings. Whereas I hear Marcus saying these are post flood creatures. So there is definitely. I that. see. I'll, I'll so, say post flood people. So, yeah. so is, is it that if, if we can if there's decent evidence, if there's really good evidence, if uh, that the Neanderthals were uh, ho uh, were part of Homo sapiens along with humans, um, that would be a point in favor of young Earth creationism. Whereas if they were not, and if they were much more ancient, that would be a point in favor of old Earth. Is that kind of the relevance of the discussion? Well, there's there's two there's a couple of ways of thinking about that. Certainly, young Earth creationists have been arguing for the full humanity of Neanderthals. Uh, since at least the 1920s. I can go back to uh, some of the writings of George McCready Price in 1921, uh, where he referred to uh, some of the early Neanderthal skeletons and said it looked like he was buried by his friends, right? Um, it's not the sort of thing you think of with chimps. Um, so young earth creationists have been making the claim for uh, Neanderthals at least for 100 years and certainly for Homo erectus and several other potentials uh, for at least the last 30 or 40 years. Um, 
William Lane Craig, for example, I just mentioned, he uh, recognizes a humanity for the Neanderthals and Denisovans and for Homo sapiens. And so he thinks that maybe Adam could be the species that gave rise to the two of them. And he puts that at Homo heidelbergensis, um, which may or may not be the ancestor to both, uh, to, to both groups. Um, it may only be the ancestor for the Neanderthals. But if so, he says, we just drop that down a little bit further, however far you need to go. So he uh, mythologizes the, um, the narratives of Genesis 1 through 11, but still wishes there to be a historical Adam based on Romans 5 primarily. Uh, and so he says, uh, if they're human and we're human, then the ancestor of those two have to be human. Um, the reasons to believe they have argued for many, many years that only Homo sapiens, in particular Homo sapiens sapiens, they reject some of the archaic Homo sapiens, um, can be human. Uh, and uh, you, usually you guys have set a date between 50 and 100, or now maybe between 100 and 150,000 years. Am I correct on that? Yeah, well, based on Genesis chapter 2, we would say that uh, God created Adam and Eve sometime during the last ice age, because the text tells us uh, that four rivers come together in the Garden of Eden. And those rivers are well identified. The text actually tells us where they all flow from. But that location today is 200 feet below sea level. But during the last ice age, it would be above sea level. So sometime during the last ice age, God created Adam and Eve. We also argue that Noah's flood is an ice age event based on how long it took the waters uh, to recede. So, but again, we're looking at a time scale of 15 to 120,000 years ago. And uh, there's a paper on our website where I talk about the difficulty of trying to debate to date the artifacts of Neanderthals and humans, early humans, because carbon-14 only takes you back about 40,000 years, and uh, we don't have another radiometric tool until we get back to about a quarter of a million years. So we got this gap uh, where we have no radiometric dating tool, and uh, some of these dates that are thrown out, we argue that the systematics can lead to a plus or minus 2,000% error. So basically making the point, all these anthropology papers, all these cite are the statistical errors, they don't address the systematic errors. And if you're talking in the last 40,000 years, you can identify the systematics. And if you're talking more than 300,000 years ago, you can again, but there's a gap where you can't. Okay, um, so it's now the third discussion period, so you're leading again, uh, Hugh, and you guys are welcome to keep talking about the Neanderthal question if that is what uh, interests you both, but I do just want to suggest that perhaps another topic might be um, interesting to our viewers if, Hugh, there's anything uh, otherwise that you'd like to press Marcus well, what on. What would be but... of interest to you, Chris? I mean, you're, you're the moderator after all. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm, I don't know that I represent our viewers. Um, I suppose I would be interested to know, um, what do you make, Hugh, about Marcus's point in his opening that in um, First and Second Peter and, and perhaps Jesus as well, they, they sort of have a, uh, a wider, they, their understanding of the known world was more expansive than the ancient Israelites, and yet they're still at that time using language that seems to suggest that the flood was global rather than um, uh, local. Um, what do you make of that line of reasoning? Do you think that it's... Uh, well, That's... here's where I would agree with Marcus. I mean, you got in Second Peter 3, 6, uh, where Peter says, uh, cosmos tote, the world that existed at that time. And you got Paul making references to the Roman world. And I would argue that the world of Rome was actually bigger than the world of Noah. And it's Second Peter 2, 5 that says, the world of ungodly people was flooded. I mean, if we're talking a global flood, I would expect to see the Greek word cosmos without any adjectives. But every time Peter addresses the flood of Noah in the second chapter and the third chapter, there's always a qualifying adjective. It's the world of ungodly people. And I think we can both agree, at that time, there were not ungodly people living in Antarctica and not ungodly people living in Greenland. Therefore, there'd be no need for God to flood Greenland and Antarctica because there's no ungodly people there to wipe out. Uh, and likewise, if you go into uh, the creation Psalms, 
and the book of Job, uh, they address creation day three. And that's when God forms continents where the world gets transformed from having only water on the surface to where we have oceans and continents coexisting. And in Psalm 104, uh, verses 6, 7, 8 refer to creation day three. And verse 9 says, once the continents are in place, never again will water cover the whole face of the earth. And so that rules out the possibility of a global flood right there in Psalm 104. And I see that repeated in all the creation psalms. I see it repeated in Job uh, 38 as well as Proverbs 8. So I do agree that the flood of Noah wiped out all ungodly people and all the soulish animals associated with ungodly people. But that doesn't mean that the flood has to be globally extensive. And that's a principle that you actually see every time God pours out his judgment, wrath, and reprobate human behavior. He always limits it to the extent of the reprobate behavior. Probably the most explicit example of that is when God has a conversation with Abraham, and Abraham says, Lord, what about all these wicked Amorites living in the hills with me? And God says, their wickedness has not yet reached its fullness. I will not touch them. I'm only going to destroy the five cities of the plain. But he says, 400 years from now, their wickedness will reach reprobate levels, and then your descendants will deal with them. And that's a principle you see throughout the entire Bible, that whenever God pours out his judgment wrath on reprobate behavior, it's always limited to the extent of the reprobate behavior. So at least in my model of the flood, there are no emperor penguins on board the ark. They wouldn't be damaged by human sin. And that's something you see in the Levitical law, uh, that God would say, hey, if a cow is in the habit of goring other animals, uh, the owner of the cow is to be spoken to. And if the cow continues in that behavior, the cow is to be killed and the owner of the cow is to be killed also. Making the point that it was that reprobate human that was responsible uh, for that violent behavior of its animal. Because after all, God designed the soulish animals to please human beings. And it's like the vicious dog syndrome. Uh, Vicious dog are always owned by vicious owners. The dog is simply trying to bring pleasure to its owner. But that's why God said uh, the human right. has to be destroyed too. Mar Marcus, before you come in, um, and I'll give you several minutes to respond, but I just want to ask a follow-up real briefly uh, to what Hugh said, because it makes me wonder then, Hugh, if if what you just explained is relevant to how you would interpret uh, Romans 8, which Marcus mentioned during his, during his opening as well. Um, in Romans 8, Paul seems to describe all of creation, pon uh, you know, ta panta, all things having been... Um, uh, having been subjected to futility as yeah. a result of the fall. So would you say that's all things, but in the context of the world, the, the human inhabited world rather than the entire cosmos or what? Well, I don't see Romans 8 explicitly pointing that out to the fall of Adam. Rather, it's making a statement. The entire universe is subject to a pervasive law of decay. Some translations use the word corruption. And this is consistent with what you see in the book of Ecclesiastes, how the second law of thermodynamics affects everything in God's creation. And again, it goes back to that point. The Bible says the laws of physics don't change. So Romans 8 is basically stating uh, this law of decay, it's always been here. It pervades the entire universe throughout its whole geography and throughout its whole history. As it says in Romans 8, 23, that law of decay will remain until the full number of humans that God intends to redeem have been redeemed. There will be a future change in the laws of physics. It's in the new creation. But it will not happen until God's redemptive work is finished. And clearly it's not finished yet. All right. Uh, I, so, I want to hear Marcus... Uh, I yeah. want to hear Marcus come back on this for a moment, but I just want to say the, the struggle I, as a young earth creationist, make with that interpretation of Romans 8 is twofold. One, it, verse tw in verse 20, Paul says the creation was subjected to futility. That sounds yeah. like it didn't begin that way. And number two, mm -hmm. um, Paul seems to describe this this decay that the cosmos is experiencing as corruption, a bondage to corruption, which doesn't seem very consistent with the language of creation being very good at the end of Genesis 
Genesis 1. But but I'll give you a chance to come back if, if you want to rebut those two points. I, I want to give Marcus well, a chance to... I can do it really to... quickly. John okay. 1633. In this world you'll have tribulation slash thermodynamics. But take heart, I've overcome the world. And so the law of thermodynamics has been present from the very beginning. But God is a God that has foreknowledge. He knew sin was going to come. He designed the universe in advance with redemption in mind. In fact, there's multiple places in the Bible that says that God began his works of redemption before he created anything at all. So I'm not at all surprised that he created the universe with gravity, electromagnetism, and thermodynamics. Because those laws of physics are powerful tools in God's hands to eradicate evil once evil comes into God's creation. Okay. And once God, once evil comes into God's creation is one of the big differences between uh, Hughes' approach uh, versus mine when it comes to these types of issues. Uh, Romans 8 is, uh, no, never explicitly says um, the fall, for example, but it alludes to it in very powerful ways. Uh, one of the ways that we see here is the creation is groaning uh, like in the pains of childbirth. I mean, what part of the Bible do we see pain, childbirth, and judgment in? Well, that's Genesis chapter 3 right there, where the woman will have great pain in childbearing. It will be uh, increased pain in childbearing. So Rome, R Paul, in writing Romans 8 here, is alluding definitely to, Gen uh, to Genesis chapter 3. He's just doing so in a way that is uh, that is more elusive what rather you than... you said yourself, Mark, is it's more... Hold on, uh, Hugh, Hugh, you've, you've been able to give uh, your perspective on quite a few things here. So uh, it's a little bit uh, of my time here. So when it comes to Romans 8, we've got the fall that is subjected. Uh, the world is subjected to futility. That means that it's being punished in some way. And it's being punished in a way that, you know, is having to go through pains until the eager expectation, the eager expectation of what? Well, the, the glorification of the sons of man, the creation is waiting until all of creation is redeemed because of us, and then it will be set free. I have no qualms with there being the laws of thermodynamics or gravity or any of that. It's not like young earth creationists think that that's not the case. The question is whether or not these are in, uh, instituted in such a way as to bring bring grave pain, suffering, and decay, uh, which is not the perspective that we have of anything in Genesis 1 or 2 or halfway through 3. It's only once we see God curse the ground, curse the animals, and uh, provide a sentence of death upon humanity that we see creation go awry. The whole reason that we can look at the world and recognize both its beauty as well as its horrific nature is because we recognize that we live in a world that is good and yet fallen. And for young earth creationists, we can recognize both of those. I did want to get back to uh, something else that we were discussing. Uh, you had brought up um, Psalm 104 and uh, as, as a psalm that is a creation um, text. And, and it's a, certainly a text that discusses creation. It is thematically organized around uh, the creation account in Genesis chapter one, but at the same time, it's not a creation text. It's not talking about how God creates the world. Uh, and especially in Psalm 104, what we see is a transition from creation actually through the flood and into the present day. But we see that because what's happening here is at the beginning, we see God enrobed in light and, and things like that. And when he's talking about the, uh, the waters, the waters of the deep, the techom, they cover the world and uh, that he then rebukes them. Is there any place in Genesis chapter one where God rebukes anything? Well, no. One of the ways that Genesis one stands completely apart from all other ancient Near Eastern creation mythologies is that there is no war or violence between God and his creation or between God and other gods. There's no rebuke of anything. God simply says, and there is. The one place where we can see an illusion for rebuke would be at the flood. And one of the reasons that we might know that Psalm 104 is alluding to the flood when it talks about the boundaries for the water is that it says that the water stood above the mountains. Well, where is it that we see the word mountains? It's not in Genesis chapter 1. The word for mountains in Hebrews is harim. We see high hills in the flood account, but we don't see anything about mountains in Genesis 1. 
So we have a rebuke, we have boundaries, we have the waters, which is the Mayim and the Tahom and the Harem. All of these are seen in Genesis chapter 7 and 8 and 6, uh, and only a couple of them are seen in Genesis 1. So Psalm 104 is utilizing Genesis 1 in a theological approach, organizing the discussion. But once it gets through this issue of things like uh, the waters and being given a boundary, after that, we are into the world that we live in today with people living and making wine and having boats and there's cities and there's predators and whatnot. This all looks like the modern world. It's not the world that God created before people. It's not the world that God created on day six. All these sorts of issues come down to a big disagreement that you and I will have about what the extent of the fall is and whether there was life that was living and dying in horrific ways prior to Adam's sin. So that tied in, into a little bit of why we have discussions about things like the Neanderthals. It's a, it's a big question about where does sin uh, come in in a particular way. We both agree that it's with Adam, but we disagree about where death comes in. And for a young earth creationist, uh, and I would say for most of, earth his, uh, most of church history, people would say that death came in because of the sin of Adam. And that explains why the world that we live in is good and yet fallen and awry. So I'll turn that back over to Chris. Thanks for giving me some time there. I was just going to let you turn it back over to Hugh. We got about uh, four more minutes, give or take, in our discussion time. So I'm just going to let you two finish this time off, and then we'll go into closings. But yeah, uh, Hugh, what are your thoughts on some of the points that uh, Marcus just made? Well, Marcus is bringing up what I think is a far more important issue than the age of the earth. Uh, was there death of plants and animals uh, before Adam sinned? Um, and you know, as I've debated young earth creationist theologians, they agree that's a far uh, more significant issue. But as I read Romans five or Romans, uh, you know, five twelve to nineteen and First Corinthians fifteen, it explicitly states that the sin of Adam brought death to all people. It doesn't say all life. It says to all people. Romans 5.12, death through sin was visited upon all people as a result of Adam's offense in the garden. Only one species of life on planet Earth is capable of sin. That's as human beings. And it says all people. It doesn't say all life. And as I debated this with young earth creationist theologians, they do admit that nowhere in the Bible uh, does it state that there was no death of plants and animals or microbes uh, before Adam sinned. And I think we also need to realize Adam's not the first sinner. Satan's the first sinner. And the Bible is silent on the date when uh, Satan actually sinned. Uh, it could have been uh, quite a bit before uh, Adam's offense in the Garden of Eden. Uh, but I also think, Marcus, you bring up another point. Exactly what happened to the laws of physics uh, when Adam sinned? I mean, my reading of uh, Genesis 3.17, cursed is the ground because of you. The ground's not producing because now we got sinful human beings working it. I don't see any change in the laws of physics at that point. What I see is a change in humanity, humanity change, and now we got humans polluting uh, the ground, and the ground doesn't produce uh, like God intended it to produce. So that is a major point of disagreement. I don't think that, uh, you know, the fall of Adam's got anything to do with the death of plants and animals. It's specific to the death of human beings, spiritual death and physical death. As Romans 5 makes clear, uh, you've got both spiritual death and physical death coming upon humanity uh, when Adam fell. Okay. Well, there's a couple of things that we do agree on that, Hugh, certainly, that uh, physical and, and spiritual death comes upon humanity. I'm glad that we're there. Um, I don't think that plant death comes along with the fall uh, because plants were given as food. They are not nephesh. They are not soulish creatures uh, like animals are. So for me, as a young earth creationist, uh, plants are given for food and the death of their cells is not considered the same in God's economy as the death of uh, breathing creatures, living creatures, those things. Oh, let me get this life. clear. Are you saying you're okay with plant death before Adam? Yes, because I don't yeah. think that the biblical uh, the biblical definition of life is the same between plants and animals. 
and the but purpose of the plan. There was no animal death. I don't believe that there. I don't. I doubt that there was animal death prior to the fall. Uh, and I would say that uh, your your approach to say that uh, the that humanity's interaction with the ground is what changes at the at the fall is mistaken. What we have is a curse on the ground, and one of the tangible effects that happens there is that thorns and thistles grow, with the implication that they weren't there before. These are now going to be impediments to human capability. They are going to be a, a way in which nature now, the creation, is at war with its vice regents. And this is one of the reasons why I think that um, we can understand that the fall is something that affects the entirety of the natural economy. To understand who we are as human beings, as made in the image of God, we are the vice regents. We, that is, we are the kings and queens over this creation. That is the, the role that we've been given. And much like kings and queens in the ancient world, the decisions that we make have effects on all of our subjects. And who are our subjects? Well, for Adam and Eve, it is the entire world. When they sin, the entire world falls with them. When God looks upon the world at the time of Noah and humanity has become so evil that all, all their thoughts are only evil continually, and all flesh was corrupted, that word all flesh, the Hebrew word basar there is referring not just to human flesh, but to all animals as well. Not just in a, and this is where we'll disagree, uh, but I would say all flesh, meaning all flesh everywhere is now under corruption and is under judgment and is going to be destroyed by God in a flood. And the fact that the flood is written in a way to undo the entirety of creation from Genesis 1 and restart it over in Genesis chapter 8 lets us know that that flood is global. Then when we take a look at uh, first, uh, Second Peter 3, Peter uses the flood as the midpoint between creation and the eschaton in order to help people understand that judgment, universal judgment, is going to uh, happen in the uh, in the future because we know it happened in the past, and it's compared to the creation itself. Worldwide, worldwide, and sitting in the middle is worldwide for these uh, for these different perspectives. Now, uh, Hugh, maybe you and I, uh, you got a chance while I uh, popped out for a little bit. Uh, you got a chance to talk a little bit about Yom. Uh, and it's meaning in uh, Genesis 1, maybe for the last little round here, you and I can talk about that. Um, and if, if you could just give me a quick summary, because I came in at the end, uh, you were talking about Yom at, uh, and it's- well, Mark, if you didn't really Genesis. miss anything, we, we waited for you to come back on. Oh, okay, okay. So, okay. Well, th thank you for that. <laughs> I got a um, but, you know, maybe, maybe this might be a, a good place for us to talk about um, for the for the listeners here. Well, well, but hold on. Before we do, I just want to let you both know that the we're now two minutes, three minutes beyond the original forty minutes of discussion time. If right. both of you still have, to, if you both of you have time to stick around a little bit longer than planned, um, you guys could finish up the discussion time on one more brief topic before we move on to closings. But I'll leave that up to you both. Well, I got a question for Marcus because what you're talking about sounds like you believe the laws of physics changed at the fall of Adam and at the flood. Is that correct? Uh, I believe that there were certain that the creation was fundamentally altered at the fall. Yes. And, and I would disagree with you on the statement that uh, the laws of physics have never changed since creation. Um, if, if we make that type of claim, then we run awry of miracle. Uh, so I think we've got to be very careful about saying that the laws of physics have never changed. Jesus fed 5000 people with two low, uh, with uh, a few loaves and a, and a couple of fish. And that was an instance of Jesus manifesting his glory as creator by creating matter and energy, by creating things that well, weren't there before. We agree there. Before we do agree future. that God is not subject to the laws of physics. The question oh, God's is, not. No. is the universe subject to the laws of physics? Is the world of nature subject to the laws of physics? Uh, was God mm -hmm. mistaken when he said the laws of physics have not changed? Well, God never says the laws of physics don't change, Hugh. I, that, that's, reading the text. that's reading the text the way that uh, a 21st century astrophysicist looks, looks at it. No, I mean, I see a lot of uh, theologians drawing exactly the same conclusion I do without a scientific perspective. The one thing I would add as an astrophysicist is that before the fall of Adam, 
we have animals and humans eating food. The sun is shining. The stars yeah. are shining. And what I could add from an astrophysical perspective, those phenomena are extremely sensitive to even the very tiniest changes in the laws of physics. So mm -hmm. the fact that we see that in Genesis 2 tells us the laws of physics before the fall are identical to the laws of physics after the fall. And we got God saying that explicitly in Jeremiah 33. No, but we still see that there is something fundamentally different that happens. When God judges the ground, there's new things that come out of the ground that weren't going to be there before. The curse on the serpent is an alteration of it in some way. And it says that cursed are you above all cattle or more than all cattle, which seems to indicate that the curse extends in some tangible physical way beyond the serpent into the other beings, the other animal created organisms of the world. So there is a rupture that happens, not just spiritually and physically for humans, but for the entire created economy, such that Romans eight later, Paul tells us that the creation is groaning, it's in pain, which means that it's not in a situation in a state like it was in Genesis one and two. There well, is something Genesis different. Three it says the pain subtle, has always been there. Tangible. The curse is more pain and more work, not pain for the first time, not work for the first time. That's, that's true. But it's an, it's an increase in some sense that we all recognize as being in some way not right. We all have the intuitive yeah, knowledge that the world is not is, right not in some physical. ways. The text says cursed is the ground because of you. It's yeah. not cursed because the laws of physics were altered. It's cursed because now we got humans who are in a sinful state working the ground. I'm not saying that the laws of physics are cursed. I'm saying that the, the universe itself is corrupted. And I, I, do you agree with that? Well, no, my whole point is the laws of physics have not changed since the cosmic creation event. And we astronomers can directly- Then what do you do with, what do you do with miracles? What do you do when, uh, when Hezekiah has a, a shadow that turns backwards, right? Um, he, well, he's in, you know, again, the, the whole test in that is to say, is hey, it's easy for the shadow to go forward, but it's hard for the shadow to go backwards because, like, you know, the sun only goes in one direction. Jesus walked on water. He raised bodily yeah. from the dead. It's the God that created space and time. He's not subject to space and time. He's not subject to the laws of physics. But right. Stars and galaxies but, are. But the stick at Hezekiah's he time was there. subject to the he laws did. of physics. All right. Right. Um, Chris. Chris, yeah, if I, I can I, ask a question. What's that? Uh, um, I just want to ask Dr. Hero's oh, yeah, question. Sure. Uh, so we had a time limit, and I really want to honor that. So if Dr. Ross is willing to stay a little longer, then we can continue. If not, we can just uh, jump uh, right into the closing thoughts. Yeah, and... I can stay a little longer, but I can't stay like an extra half hour. So Right, yeah. So, okay, yeah. so let's say we got about 10 more minutes. Yeah, Thanks for making the extra time. Thank you, Hugh. Okay. If, if, if you guys, if you guys can both spare ten more minutes for discussion time, and then a total of sixteen minutes after that for each of your closings, so a total of twenty-six minutes from now, then um, I think we've got time for that. Otherwise, we'll probably need to move into closings. Yeah, I can probably. Yeah, I got to end right at six my time. So. Okay. Well, I'll give you guys. Why don't, another... why don't we just head into closing then to make sure that he's got uh, the, the time that he needs? I'm comfortable with that. Um, I will say I'm really badly wanting to respond to a couple things that Dr. Hugh Ross mentioned there toward the end what, about. I can stay for 20, so why don't you jump in with your questions? Well, so all I was going to say was it's it seems to me that when God says cursed is the ground because of you, he's not saying that moving forward, the reason that the ground is producing thorns and not being fruitful is because of the way it's being managed by man. Rather, it's saying that it's because of you, your sin, because of what you did, Adam, that the ground is now cursed. So I wasn't it didn't make sense to me why you made the argument that because what you said was. The text says cursed is the ground because of you, not cursed is the ground because the laws of physics have changed. But that argument implies that because of you means that it's the way Adam will will thenceforth manage the ground that the ground is cursed. But I don't think that's tenable. I think it's saying because you sinned, so the ground is cursed. Do, do you have reason to suggest otherwise, Hugh? Yeah, no, I hold the view that the ground is cursed because we got sinners managing it. Uh, nothing 
not the soil didn't change the physics didn't change it's the same soil the same physics the same plants and animals but now we got sinful human so were there thorns animals. were there thorns and thistles prior to this point the Bible is silent on whether or not there were th thorns and thistles before the fall. Uh, I would argue uh, that, yeah, there was plants and animals existing before the fall. They probably weren't substantially different from what existed after the fall. I do agree that in the Garden of Eden, uh, God had planted the garden. It was well managed and tended. We got Adam tending the garden. So I do agree that life outside the garden was different because outside the garden, You've got an untended realm inside the garden. You've got this gorgeous garden uh, where, you know, uh, God uh, uh, created it and basically said, Adam, hey, uh, I designed this. Take good care of it. Uh, but once he's outside the garden, it's like, well, here's the real world. Uh, well, so and from a from an earth history perspective, there are thorns and thistles in the fossil record. So if you're going to say that the earth is ancient, then uh, the curse on the ground to bring forth thorns and thistles uh, quite honestly, seems a strange one because they're already around. Uh, and, no, no, I would agree. You know, from, I'm, not, I'm not disputing that. But from, again, from a textual saying, perspective, I think that's a hard a hard line to uh, to indicate. I mean, you seem to have a place like Eden that, that Adam and Eve are, are supposed to continue to extend out, and you know, there's no there's no sort of sense of difficulty whatsoever. But cursed cursed is the ground for your sake, not cursed is the ground because you're working it. It's, oh, it's he also the got ejected from the ground, so, not humanity uh, in this case. Yeah, it's not our mismanagement is, initially that is causing this. It's God. Nowhere in the Bible a, does a it say there were no, Yeah, nowhere in the Bible does it say there were no no thorns or thistles before the fall. The Bible there, is there's like religion. there's like forty total verses before this, Hugh. I mean, there's only so much the Bible is going to tell us. Uh, when we've got the abbreviated description of the creation of the world in Genesis chapter one, and then we have the creation of humans, we're not given a whole lot of information, but we also don't want to rely on the fact that there isn't something said about thorns to, to be our defense for there could be thorns. Uh, that becomes a tricky sort of thing to do when it seems no, like I'm thorns just saying are we shouldn't divide over something that the Bible is silent on. I I'm mean, sorry? We shouldn't divide over something that the Bible is silent on. Hugh, in, in, with the utmost of respect, I don't think we are. I think what we're dividing on, although not in the um, uh, ecclesiologic, ecclesiological sense of divide, but just in disagreement, I think what we're disagreement, disagreeing on is where the text isn't silent. Because what we're talking about is, is where God is pronouncing the curse on the ground and on Adam, and it's in the context of the curse that God says, cursed is the ground because of you, thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. So even though there's no sense, uh, even though there's no statement about thorns and thistles prior to this point, it does at least seem sort of to uh, face value to a reader like me that thorns and thistles being brought forth for Adam was something that was new as a consequence for his sin. Um, that's yeah, where I'm coming from, at least. not an issue. Because Adam was in the Garden of Eden, a garden planted and designed and uh, you know set up by God, and now they're outside the garden. And notice God sent two angels with fiery swords to prevent them from coming back to the Garden of Eden. And you know a good analogy is you go. Well, I mean uh, you're there in Seattle, in Vancouver they've got this uh, you know Queen Elizabeth Park. Victoria has the Butchard Gardens. If you ever go to a place like that. I mean, you can just see how well tended it is. There's no thorns and thistles uh, in the butchard gardens. Somebody tended it to make sure they wouldn't be there. But hey, as soon as you get outside the butchard gardens, you do see uh, blackberry bushes. They're everywhere. All right. I hear you. A final 60 seconds of, of response from you, Marcus, and then we'll move into closing so that we can make sure to get Hugh out on time. Um, sure. So, uh, you know, when it, when it comes to these types of issues, we both Hugh and I, and, and you guys as well, right? We want to hew close to the text. We want to be close. Uh, we all want to have a reading that it is uh, faithful, that uh, holds to uh, a high view of scripture and inerrancy. And uh, you know, Hugh and I have our differences here. And I think these differences matter. But, you know, at the same time, uh, if, if we are in church and they're offering communion, I will walk up with you and we will take communion together because we're both, both brothers in the Lord. I think these questions and how we answer them ultimately do have 
big impacts on what we think in other sorts of areas. And that's why both Hugh and I are really passionate about these sorts of things and why we, we've spent our time trying to think through these issues in various ways. So I appreciate the effort that Hugh has gone into this. Uh, I hope he appreciates the efforts that I've gone uh, into this. And uh, if we find ourselves at church, we'll sit next to each other. We'll be singing together. Amen. That's beautiful. All right. Well, with that having been a, a fantastic end to the um, discussion period, let's move into closings, beginning with Hugh Ross. You've got eight minutes and um, we'll move on to Marcus when you're done. Right. Well, I think you, we've, we've seen a good work done by the rate study, two volume set, uh, where they try to have come up with a scientific argument for the earth being young. But multiple times in the rate study, they say, if there's no change in the laws of physics, then the Earth must be old and the universe must be old. Both bodies must be billions of years old. And as I've mentioned in the, in the talk we've had here, the Bible explicitly tells us there's been no change in the laws of physics. And then we've got the book of nature. Astronomical measurements affirm abundantly and exhaustively that there's been no change in the laws of physics. When we look at the sun, we're measuring the laws of physics eight minutes ago because that's how long it took the light to reach us. Every single star and galaxy we look at, we see exactly the same laws of physics we see here on Earth, all the way back to the cosmic creation event. We actually have telescopes powerful enough to get back to when the universe was only a hundred billionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second old, and the laws of physics there measure to be the same they are here. As I mentioned, and as is admitted in the rate study, all young Earth creations models critically depend on the laws of physics radically being altered, not just by a factor of 10, but millions of times at the fall of Adam and the uh, flood of Noah. And uh, astrophysics rules that out. Also, the isotopes we see in the crust of the Earth rule out any possibility that the radiometric decay rates have ever been altered in the history of the Earth. And again, you can't sustain a global flood model or a young Earth model from that perspective. I actually participated in a Four Views book called Four Views on Creation, Evolution, and Intelligent Design. Uh, the four authors were myself, Ken Ham of Answers in Genesis, uh, Deborah Harzma of uh, uh, BioLogos, and Steve Meyer of the Discovery Institute. What was interesting is we debated biblical inerrancy. But of the four authors, I was the only one that endorsed the International Council of Biblical Inerrancy affirmations and denials without any reservation at all. And uh, I think, you know, that's coming where I'm coming from, that the word of God, both in the book of nature and the book of scripture are inspired and inerrant. Uh, there's no errors and that the Bible actually has predictive power. It has the power to predict future scientific discoveries I see that in the opening page of Genesis, how it lays out these creation events in a particular order, and uh, uh, how the sequence is scientifically accurate, the descriptions are scientifically accurate. And I see that as true of the entire Bible. No matter wherever it addresses science, we can come up with evidence from the book of nature that sustains the Bible set at first and has set it accurately. And uh, I do think that the issue we discussed, death before Adam, that's actually more important than the age of the Earth. And uh, just to explain the biodeposits in the crust of the Earth, 76 plus quadrillion biodeposits are in the crust of the Earth. And to get that quantity of biodeposits, uh, you need the sun shining for a lot more than a few thousand years. It literally must be shining for billions of years to explain the huge quantity of biodeposits Biodeposits, I would argue, were crucial for launching human civilization to make possible the redemption of billions of human beings in a short period of time. The last thing I would raise up is the issue we were discussing about biological evolution. And uh, you know, this is not coming from me, it's coming from my atheists that have been criticizing young earth creationists, making the point that the young earth model needs to invoke extremely aggressive naturalistic evolution to explain how you get carnivores from herbivores at the fall of Adam, uh, since in young earth creationism, there's no death of animals uh, before the fall of Adam. 
but you've also got a problem with Noah's flood. That young earth creationists claim uh, that the millions of land species of life uh, came from the few thousand on board Noah's Ark, and therefore they again evoke extremely aggressive evolution. Now, to be fair, they never use the word uh, evolution. They use the term diversification, but it's identical to the naturalistic evolution that atheists invoke to explain the history of Earth's life. And only from an old Earth perspective can you avoid adopting aggressive naturalistic evolution. Now, I will admit a lot of my peers indeed are evolutionists, but we at Reasons to Believe do not fall in that camp. We believe that humans are specially created. We believe that the bipedal primates, like the Neanderthals and Homo erectus and the Australopithecines, likewise God specially created them, as he did every major animal and plant group that we see throughout the whole history of the Earth. It's God that's involved in the origin of life and actually creating life in such a way to ensure that we human beings have all the resources we need all the biodeposits we need to quickly launch civilization and take the good news of salvation to all the people groups of the world. Well, thank you so much for those closing thoughts, Hugh. Um, and we'll turn things over to Marcus for his closing now. Go ahead, Marcus. Thank you, and again, thank you to, to you and Santi for uh, hosting and for Hugh for joining uh, with me today. Young Earth creationism, I firmly believe, makes the most sense of the scriptures as well as the science. It is able to produce together a consistency of understanding that goes throughout church history. There's good exegetical reasons why we Young Earth creationists just keep hanging around in this discussion. The creation days are days as we experience them. They are written with the only word that could understand, be understood as day bracketed by evening and morning, which help us to know that the day had a beginning and an end with regards to the light on earth. And that over the course of those six days, God created everything that we see around us, that God uh, created at the end of those six days, human beings, in order to be his vice regents, to be the stewards who would watch over this world on his behalf to make it thrive and to have dominion in a way that he himself has dominion over the entirety of the universe. That universe is at his beck and call. Dr. Ross has mentioned a couple of times that the laws of physics have never changed since the beginning of creation. But I might ask, does God serve the laws of physics or do the laws of physics serve God and serve his purposes? Cannot God uphold the world in any way of, uh, that he determines in, in any way of his choosing? that if he decides to curse the world in a way that fundamentally and without the work of God irreparably damages this entire creation, can that still continue on in a way that is functioning and operable as it was before the fall, but now slightly distorted? Of course it can. God uses the laws of physics in order to keep the world and our universe operating on a day-to-day -day basis that makes sense so that we may make sense of it and fulfill our role as vice regents. In order to have dominion, we must understand the world and God in his grace has made it understandable. Yet at the same time, there seem to be clear instances, both involving God's uh, work in the person of Jesus Christ, as well as in miracles performed by his prophets throughout the Old and New Testament they go counter to our experience with the laws of physics and everyday activities. The dead are raised to life. The sun turns back in the sky. A flood that destroys the entire world is sent. All of these and more are events that involve the miraculous, involve taking the world from the way that it normally operates. And God decides to overrule the way that physics normally operates because that is his pleasure. That is his purview. Adam and Eve are indeed the first people. As a young earth creationist, uh, we affirm along with the history of the church that there are no pre-Adamites, that there are no co-Adamites. This is a point at which old earth creationists and theistic evolutionists simply cannot join in the chorus of the church 
of the years that it has been around. The young earth creationism remains faithful to the statement of only Adam, only Eve, the only people from the beginning of creation through which all humans have come. This includes humans that look like us and some that don't, some that might look a little bit different. Things like Neanderthals, Denisovans, Homo erectus are indeed and in fact human beings that had the image of God and could have been saved by the Lord's grace. Maybe some of them did know him, but they are not animals. They are not uh, merely bipedal primates. They are people for whom Christ died. And the fact that they look different from us doesn't mean that they weren't human any more than anybody else who doesn't look like me is no argument that they are or are not human. The only thing that makes one a human is if they are a descendant of Adam and Eve. Young Earth creationism is also alone in being able to affirm a worldwide flood that wipes out the entire world at the time of Noah. Not just the people at the time of Noah, but the entire world, because the flood is an undoing of the entire creation. These and more, both from the Old and New Testament, are the reasons why young earth creationism remains strong scripturally. As I mentioned in my opener, and as we've discussed a little bit here today, there are other good reasons from a scientific perspective why young earth creationism can explain the data from the natural world as well. From recognizing vast quantities of uh, sedimentary deposits draped across continents in ways that are not analogous to anything around today, to the sudden appearance of different groups and their sudden demise in the fossil record, these are consistencies with young earth from a perspective of creation, fall, flood, and redemption. Uh, in one last parting point, I'd like to say that young earth creationism does allow for a large amount of speciation. It allows for a large amount of diversification, but to be referring to this as naturalistic evolution is simply incorrect. And to say that creationists believe that carnivores evolved from herbivores at the time of the fall is not accurate at all. Rather, carnivores are part of the curse on creation. The thorns and the thistles representing the curse on the ground. And the curse on the serpent indicates, again, more than all cattle, that the curse's effects extend out into the animal world as well. It would be at that time that I would expect carnivores to occur, not because of evolution, but because of the judgment of God, a judgment that we still are subject to, and that the universe is subject to, but mercifully one which will be redeemed in its entirety, a curse that will be overcome completely in the second coming of Jesus Christ. May that day come soon. Thank you. All right. Well, amen to that final parting word. I appreciate it. Uh, Doctors Hugh and Marcus Ross, I'm so grateful to have had this opportunity. Um, I very much enjoyed the discussion, if I'm being honest, especially when it got a little bit uh, contentious. Uh, but that's just me. I like a good fight. Uh, but for the most part, this was a fantastic discussion between brothers and exactly the kind of discussion uh, on a point of disagreement that I'd like to see other Christians have on this topic. So viewers, please do model your own discussions on this topic after how um, doctors Hugh and Marcus ha uh, Ross have interacted with each other. Um, so thank you both for your time. I very much appreciate it. And Santi, thank you to you for letting me moderate the debate. I very much appreciate it. Do you want to come in and close us out, uh, Santi? Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for taking the time to be here tonight. Dr. Ross, um, thank you so much for uh, given as your time, both of you, actually, Dr. Hugh and Dr. Marcus, I keep forgetting that both of you have the same, same last name. I uh, really, really appreciate it. Um, Dr. Hugh Ross has been on my channel quite a few times, same with uh, Dr. Rana. And Dr. Marcus, I will be looking forward to perhaps having you on my channel as well, having more discussions about different topics. And uh, again, thank you so much. Uh, and if any of you guys enjoyed this conversation, don't forget to like share and subscribe with other individuals. I thought the conversation was very uh, cordial, respectful, and uh, it was done in the spirit of uh, trying to understand each other, trying to understand other positions, but uh, that yet at the same time, I think that it, it serves as a model for us to be able to have these discussions. And sometimes, um, yeah, just um, things may get out of hand uh, at the lay level and all that stuff. But um, yeah, I really appreciate both of your work and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.